Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Chris Justice, and I'm here again uh, today to join you all, uh, hopefully to answer as many employment law related questions as I can. I am, of course, an employment lawyer working with Sam Fear to Markin. I work out of the law firm's Toronto offices. And uh, as I say, get your questions in um, and I'll do my best to answer as many as possible. Um, but having said that, as I always do, I like to start uh, with a few main topics uh, off the top. Um, and uh, today, uh, like in previous episodes, it'll focus around COVID-19 and this ongoing pandemic. Um, first of all, I want to say that if you are an employee and you have been laid off due to the pandemic and you're being told it is a temporary layoff, but you were laid off back in March uh, or perhaps April of 2020, um, and you still have not been called back, you uh, should probably get in touch with a lawyer as soon as possible. Because if you wait more than two years from the day that you were laid off and you try and go after uh, the company at a later date for severance, uh, if you pass that two year deadline, uh, you may very well be out of luck, even if you are potentially entitled to significant severance. So again, if you find yourself in a situation where you've been laid off for almost coming up on two years now, you'll want to get in touch with us uh, to know what your severance entitlements are and to get the ball rolling uh, ASAP, because that deadline is fast approaching. Uh, second point I'll raise off the top uh, has to do with the COVID-19 policies that many employers by now have implemented and have done so going back to the latter half of last year. Uh, even though the COVID situation appears to be getting better and hopefully resolves shortly, uh, that has not stopped many employers from continuing to implement COVID policies and specifically policies that mandate the vaccination. In other words, if you are not vaccinated, uh, you will lose your job or we'll place you on a suspension or we'll terminate your employment, something along those lines. So if you're also an employee uh, faced with a situation like that, and you're wondering whether or not your employer can actually get away with terminating your employment and potentially not giving you any severance at all on your way out, then uh, that's another reason why you will want to contact us because there is a very, very good chance that in those cases, you are in fact owed severance uh, and that could potentially be as much as two years worth of severance. So you don't want to wait too long either in those situations and you definitely want to give us a call um, because I'm sure we can be of help. And this has to do, by the way, if you're an employee in Ontario, uh, if you're in Alberta, BC, uh, these are the provinces that our law firm operates in. So if you're someone in those situations, uh, give us a shout. I'm sure we can be of help, as I said. Uh, the last thing I wanted to touch on had to do uh, with a, something a bit more recently. Uh, I'm not sure if anyone has heard of the recent legislation that has been passed uh, in Ontario um, regarding the tracking of employee devices. So for the longest time, employers or many employers, I'm sure, have been monitoring their employees uh, in terms of perhaps the cell phones they use or the computers they use. And this is specifically with respect to company property. So if you're an employee and you've been given a company phone or a company laptop and you use that phone or laptop, not just for work purposes, but for per more personal reasons, um, you need to be generally aware that there could be some monitoring of those devices going on. And this recent legislation um, that's come into the fold is going to, or now requires employers to actually disclose the ways in which they are monitoring any such devices. And you may think uh, that that is something that is unacceptable as far as your employer monitoring these devices. Uh, however, I will say that there are definitely circumstances in which an employer can do that, especially if it relates to its own property, 
and especially if the monitoring took place or takes place during work hours. So you want to be mindful of that, number one. But with this new legislation, at least there will be some transparency uh, provided and you'll know exactly what is being monitored, if anything, and why it's being monitored. And if it's being monitored for a reason that is not connected to a legitimate business reason or rationale, then there could be some issues for the employer. And as an employee, you actually may have some options uh, that could potentially trigger severance entitlements and greater amounts of compensation. If your employer can, on the other hand, prove that there are legitimate reasons for monitoring, then it's not to say that they can't do it. And if you were to refuse to be monitored uh, full stop, for example, uh, there is a possibility that you could lose your job and actually not be entitled to any severance. So again, I'm not sure if anyone's totally aware of this recent legislation uh, news, but I wanted to, to raise that. And, and if you find yourself in a situation where uh, your employer is monitoring things, perhaps in bad faith and insisting that they do so, or perhaps not being clear, transparent as to why they're monitoring certain things. Another reason why you'll want to get in touch with us, and I'm sure we can be of some assistance. So having said that, uh, I just want to now go into some questions. Uh, thank you, everyone, for uh, sending in your questions. Uh, the first question I've got comes from uh, an individual on YouTube, uh, VS2015M, uh, who's saying that they are an employer uh, working or operating a business in Alberta. And they're asking if an employee has been denied uh, an STD claim, so short-term disability, uh, is the employer legally entitled to ask them to return to work? Um, so first of all, I always look at the uh, actual disability benefit policy itself uh, as a general starting point, because that will <clears throat> perhaps shed some light on some of the processes involved especially if the disability insurer is separate and apart from the business itself. Um, but the second question you have to ask is, why are they being denied short-term disability? Is the denial a legitimate denial? Is the denial something that the insurer has denied perhaps in bad faith? I mean, these are things you may need to investigate uh, to ensure that uh, the denial was proper before necessarily demanding they go back to work because you don't want to be in a situation where you demand someone go back to work simply because their disability claim was denied um, when there may be other factors at play. Um, and also you should have to consider even though their disability claim is denied, they may still have limitations. Um, so perhaps they are disabled uh, to one degree or another um, but maybe just not to a degree that would render them completely incapable of work. And so there may be some accommodations uh, that you have to take into consideration uh, before insisting they go back to work. Because again, you don't want to jump the gun or act too hastily and then find yourself in a situation where even though a denial has happened, your employee is now claiming that you violated or breached their human rights. Um, having said all of this, uh, I do also want it known that um, I myself am not uh, a disability lawyer per se. I do have some knowledge in the area, but we as a law firm in general have a number of lawyers whose bread and butter is the disability side of things. So um, I, would, I was going to suggest in any event, uh, BS 2015, give us a shout, give our um, office a call, uh, set up a consultation. And I'm sure that we can get you connected with one of our lawyers who um, actually uh, helps on the disability, the insurance side of things. Um, and, and to the extent there are also employment related matters, which often there are overlap, we could also help out with that. So give us a call. Uh, we'll probably need to flesh out the situation a bit more just to make sure that you're crossing all the T's, dotting all the I's and, and taking the necessary steps. But thank you for your question. Uh, I've got another question in here from Julia on YouTube, and Julia is asking if I returned to work for a period of time during COVID and then I was put back on a layoff, is my layoff from the first, sorry, is my layoff time from the first layoff or my second? Um, and sorry, I just want to make sure I, I understand your question correctly. So you, you were laid off uh, 
during COVID, you went back to work and then they put you back on a layoff. So that would, um, I mean, it would be in many sense a second layoff, but your employer generally under the Employment Standards Act, if we're talking Ontario, has the ability to lay you off uh, up to 35 weeks in a 52 week calendar period. So it would depend on how many weeks there are and, and over, you know, in that 52 week period, um, counting both the first and the second layoff, whether or not that added up to something more than that. But you should also know, Julia, that your employer doesn't have the inherent right to lay you off at all, unless there's something normally in a contract that you signed or some sort of document that you sign that says they have that ability. Even if the legislation uh, refers to layoffs and refers to employers being able to lay people off for a certain amount of time within that time frame, um, don't assume that they have that right. Uh, so number one, you may be able to actually assert a constructive dismissal and claim severance. Um, but if we're just talking legislation wise in Ontario, and I speak in terms of the Ontario law, uh, an employer has that ability 35 weeks in a 52 week period. Um, but during that period of time, they should at the very least be offering some benefit continuation, but it's not always black and white. And this may be another situation you want to give us a call because you actually may have more options than, than you think. Uh, but thank you, uh, also for your, for your question. I, uh, I've got another question in here from Daniel on YouTube. Daniel's asking as a health and safety coordinator, can I be terminated for reporting a near miss incident? I have a picture that shows a potential hazard, but I've been employed for less than 90 days. So you seems like are doing your job in the sense of highlighting potential uh, safety or health hazards. Um, so it seems like by reporting a near miss incident and showing a potential hazard that you're doing your job. Um, now you're also asking whether or not you can be terminated for doing this. And, uh, I wouldn't say that's a legitimate reason to terminate someone's employment, but it also could be as a result of another, uh, factor or another situation that I'm not aware of, because generally speaking, an employer can terminate an employee's employment for whatever reason it wants, as long as it's not in bad faith or, or for some discriminatory reason. Uh, which itself uh, can be often challenging to prove. Um, and if they are going to terminate you, they often have to provide you with severance. So I guess the question is, Daniel, whether or not you can prove specifically that the termination, excuse me, um, occurred because of that reporting as sort of a, a form of reprisal or retaliation, or uh, whether or not your employers uh, suggesting that the termination happened for other reasons. So, um, and then you mentioned you've been employed for less than 90 days. So your employer may be also taking the position that you're not actually owed any severance uh, because you haven't passed the probationary period, but that isn't necessarily true either. So that itself would maybe come down to whether or not you signed a contract and specifically what that contract says. And even if the contract says we can let you go within 90 days without any pay, don't necessarily assume that that's what in fact can happen. Um, and that that's a contract that will have to be looked at by a lawyer and, and examined in a bit more um, detail and thoroughness. So uh, Daniel, you may be in a situation where there's bad faith present and uh, you may want to give us a call so we can talk to you a bit uh, about it a bit more. But thanks uh, as always for your question. Moving on, we've got uh, a question coming in from Monica on Facebook. Monica is asking, my employer uh, or stating that her employer put her on a leave without pay and offered voluntary severance. Uh, she has 17 unused vacation days from last year. And she's asking if her employer owes her money for the 17 days she didn't use. So uh, number one, people need to understand there's a difference between vacation pay and vacation time. So uh, I guess my first question, Monica, would be, um, whether or not your employer has paid out all the pay, the vacation pay uh, at the end of the year or any accrued uh, but unused vacation pay or time. Um, and secondly, whether or not there's some policy in your in your company that says you cannot accrue uh, vacation time from previous years. So a lot of times if you don't use your vacation, uh, 
by the end of the calendar year, you might get a certain payout at the end of the year. Sometimes employers also pay out vacation every every two weeks, like with, with part of your check each two weeks. Um, but ordinarily, there are uh, vacation amounts that are owed uh, as of the day of someone's termination. Um, and uh, that's something that's usually a non-contentious item. So you may want to get some clarity um, over that with them as far as what owed days there are and find out what the response is and maybe get back in touch with us to see what next steps could take place, if any. Um, you should also know, Monica, that if your employer puts you on a, a leave without pay and that was not your decision or you didn't consent to that, that that is in many cases a constructive dismissal for which you're owed severance. So when you say your employer offered you voluntary severance, um, I'm not sure exactly what you mean by voluntary, but it could very well be the case that they just simply owe you severance regardless of whether or not they want to volunteer it or not. So um, again, this may be a situation you want to give us a call, Monica, so we can flesh out a bit more. Um, but it seems like you could potentially be owed fairly significant severance uh, depending on how long you've been there, how old you are, what kind of role you had with the company, and uh, as well, whether you would have signed any contract that could affect your severance entitlements. Um, uh, so I've got a question, another follow-up from VS2015M uh, regarding Ontario, the disconnect from work legislation, and whether that covers management. So yeah, there, there are still a lot of questions over this form of legislation. And by the way, this disconnect from work legislation for the, for the listeners has to do with legislation being put forth where um, employers essentially can't necessarily ask their employees after hours to do various work related items. And, and the goal is of course, to provide a better work-life balance, um, especially for those working from home nowadays. Um, however, if you are in management and you, as uh, a matter of fact, in the past, it typically worked after hours, then this disconnect from work legislation may not necessarily prevent your employer from continuing on that type of a relationship. So it all comes down to prior to the disconnect from work legislation coming out, what were the expectations on you as management? What were you expected to work? What were your hours? Uh, was it the case that you had to work sometimes after hours? Um, and I think that's a lot different than someone who just typically works nine to five, let's say, and all of a sudden their employer is asking them to work, you know, nine to nine. You know, in that case, you could maybe reference that legislation to some effect, but not in all cases. So um, hopefully that that helps answer at least your question or part of your question. Um, but thanks, thanks again for the follow up. So I've got another one in here from Ted on YouTube. Ted stating that he was laid off without pay on February 7th of this year due to the vaccine policy of his employer. And he's not received any severance and he's been with the agency for 15 years. So yeah, this is something I mentioned at the outset of today's uh, session where I said that if you are an employee and you have been, uh, essentially, if, you've, if they've stopped paying you, whether it's a termination or a suspension or a leave of absence and you didn't consent to it and it's because you did not comply with their policy, then there's a very good chance that you're owed severance, especially being there for 15 years. I mean, you could get upwards of 15, 16, 17, 18 months, maybe even more. Um, so don't simply accept that as status quo. Um, better to act sooner rather than later, uh, because it's probably going to be the case that your employer will just continue to keep you on that layoff without pay for as long as it possibly can uh, until you either go away or find another job or they terminate you. So you want to you want to take action now. It's already been a month from from what it sounds like, where you haven't been paid. So get in touch with us, and and you very well may have significant severance entitlements. Um, Ted, sorry, Ted's got a follow up statement um, saying that he filed a grievance through the union. So I didn't know uh, Ted that you were unionized, and I will say for everyone's uh, benefit that the information and advice I'm giving um, pertains primarily to non unionized. Uh, employees. So if you're an employee who's in a union 
you've got your collective bargaining agreement that's going to set out a lot of the terms and, and processes to follow as far as grievances are concerned. You also have your local union rep who you can uh, defer to or refer to uh, in terms of what your rights may be. Um, so I'll just say that first thing, but uh, sorry, Ted, you're saying that you were told the employer wants to go to straight arbitration, which will take eight months. And again, that is a process that I'm not overly familiar with, but I do know that the union arbitration process can take some time. And for the most part, you have to follow that process. There's, there's no way that you can um, get around or circumvent that process. Um, and, and go through other channels before going through the process that's set out in your collective bargaining agreement. And if your collective bargaining agreement has an arbitration clause in it, then that may be the process that you need to follow. But, you know, take this with a slight grain of salt, just because I don't practice primarily in, in union work, but that's my general understanding um, in any event. So hopefully that, that helps you and um, uh, definitely wish you all the best there, Ted. Uh, so I've got a question in from Roberta. She's asking me to touch on constructive dismissal for a person whose job description has changed extensively. Um, and yeah, happy to do that, Roberta. So a constructive dismissal in terms of a definition is when there's been a significant change to the terms of your employment without your consent or, or changes. And if you're saying that your job has, uh, your job description has changed extensively, then it's probably fair to assume that they've got you doing something or they're trying to have you do something that you didn't sign up to do. And if you don't agree to those changes, number one, make yourself, make it known, put, put it in writing, um, clarify exactly what the changes are and why they represent significant changes, clarify the fact that that's not something you signed up to do. And that's not something um, you're agreeable to doing. Um, but also reiterate that you're very much willing to do the job you signed up to do and continue to work there if that's in case the fact. At that point, you've got a record. Your employer is going to have to likely respond and say one thing, whether it's okay, Roberta, um, we'll, we'll give you your old job back or sorry, Roberta, it is what it is either accept it or, or don't. And if that's the case and they just simply don't give you any leeway whatsoever, then you could easily be in a constructive dismissal situation. And at that point, you may have the ability to essentially walk away from that job as though you've been terminated and demand your full severance. Having said that, uh, Roberta, I would tell you to get in touch with us just because in these kinds of situations, you want to make sure that you paper the trail correctly. You want to make sure that you don't necessarily say anything that could be construed as potentially damaging uh, to your case. And so we've got many lawyers um, at our firms that can kind of take you through that whole process and either ghostwrite letters or emails for you uh, or get involved more formally at a later date. Again, just to make sure that you know, everything's being preserved and you're not going to do or say something that may end up affecting a potential case down the road. But what you have described is a pretty classic example of a constructive dismissal for which you would be entitled your full severance. Um, another question in from M. Ellie on YouTube, who's asking if they can get severance from their employer for placing them on an unpaid leave for not getting vaccinated, even though the Ontario government mandated uh, the, vac the, the injections, the vaccine. So uh, first of all, I, even though you may think that there's a government mandate, I would question that because in most cases there is not. Um, and if there is a government mandate, it may actually not mandate the vaccine, but provide options. So for example, there are government recommendations that apply to certain businesses that will require the business to either have someone vaccinated or submit to testing. Um, and a lot of times employers just go with the vaccine and they don't bother with the testing. So they're not even necessarily in compliance with that sort of mandate. Um, secondly, there's other considerations. For example, if you can do your job from home uh, 100% without any issue, and your employer is insisting you come into the office to get vaccinated, then from a practical standpoint, that doesn't make a lot of sense. 
and there may actually be a, a duty to accommodate you in that in that particular situation. Um, and also, as these uh, mandates and restrictions are loosening, as the pandemic is slowly resolving, uh, these kinds of cases may be looked at in a slightly different light uh, than they were beforehand. And so uh, there's also a question of when are you placed on the leave? What was the state of the law or the world at that time? Um, and so I, I just don't think any of these cases are necessarily black and white. So um, MLE, if you know, it seems like you're in a situation where you may have some rights. And I would say before just assuming that there is a mandate in place, give, definitely give us a call. Because the other thing you got to remember is even if there is a mandate in place, does that mean that your employer can terminate you for cause? Or does that mean that your employer can put you on an unpaid leave of absence for an indefinite period of time? Not necessarily. Um, so there's a lot of complexities to this and a lot of it is to be fair, unprecedented. Um, but, but you may very well have some options. So you want to give us a call and, um, you can find out more there and, and we'll take it from there. Um, I got another follow-up from Ted asking or stating these ineligible for EI. Um, and I'll make a point, uh, just cause I know a lot of people are in this situation where, they have lost their job or they've been put on uh, an unpaid leave of absence for not getting vaccinated. And now they've gone and tried to get EI only to be told by Service Canada that they're not entitled to EI. And it is a very frustrating situation to be in. Um, what I tell people, what I tell my clients is to certainly apply for EI, explain the situation, highlight the fact that you've essentially lost your job. Um, for not complying with a vaccine policy when in all likelihood there's no government mandate requiring that um, and perhaps you know you might be able to work from home like I mentioned a minute ago um, and just to kind of highlight the disproportionate or the disproportionality between what you did and what the company did in response now you may still get denied uh, EI Ted and, and others you may still get denied if you apply I would appeal that decision and I would appeal it until I couldn't appeal it anymore and just carry out that whole process. Um, because, you know, very well, by the end of that process, the world may have changed even more so. And there may be a reversal of that decision. Um, I myself am, am helping out people specifically with these EI claims, um, while at the same time helping them get severance from their from their former employer. Um, but that's, in essence, what I would be doing, too, is, is stating what happened and essentially pleading EI, uh, pleading for EI to give you those benefits, because um, I, I agree, I don't think it's right to be denied EI in those particular contexts. I don't think the punishment necessarily fits the crime and to be denied EI um, is definitely a tough pill to swallow. So I would just fight it until I couldn't anymore. But if you want further information on some things you could do, Ted, again, please give us a call. Uh, um, excuse me, I, uh, sorry, I have, I can't get to everyone's question, but just trying to answer as many as I can. Um, so I've got a question in uh, coming in from TAS on YouTube asking about uh, asking if I could touch on constructive dismissals of mandating vaccination. Uh, again, um, I said this before, I'll say it again. If you are being told that you need to be vaccinated or otherwise you lose your job, whether you want to view that as a constructive dismissal or just a straight up termination, there's a very good chance you're owed severance either way. Um, if there's nothing in your contract saying you need a vaccine to work, um, I mean, that can certainly help. It's not the full story, but I don't think that's the main thing that you should be looking at. It's going to come down to whether or not there's any mandate in place, what that mandate says. And also again, whether or not practically speaking, you can do your job from home and, and thereby, Kind of avoid the whole necessity of being around people which it seems like is the primary concern from from a lot of these employers so if you can plead with them on that basis and show them that logically or practically speaking it shouldn't matter that may um, definitely help out or at least you can paper your trail at that point so that later on you can um, bring that back up and explain to to whoever that you were trying to be reasonable here looking for accommodation etc with that said, um, I, I will call it a day for today, everyone. I do appreciate everyone's time as always. I hope I answered as many questions uh, satisfactorily as I could. Um, I will be back, um, as I always say. Uh, 
Uh, so definitely look out for me again in the future if you want to touch base and, and join the session. Um, as you see down there below, we've got uh, another one with Lior Samfiru on March the 9th at 1 p.m. So definitely want to tune into that if you have any other questions. And um, as always, everyone, do take care and have a great rest of your day. Thanks a lot.